Okay, good evening, everyone. We're just waiting for participants to arrive. Um, so welcome along to you all. Um, we're hosting a live webinar tonight on Greater Cambridge Local Plan, uh, our first proposals. This is our fourth webinar session. We've already done um, three others and you can see them on our website. We'll give you details of how to access them later on. Um, today's session is all about climate change and water. So very apt subject at the moment not just um, from the COP26, but also from our own perspective of bringing some of the climate change stuff into our own local plan. Um, what I'm going to do is we'll go around the screen. We've got a really, really good panel for here tonight. We've got, um, we've got some of our consultants who've been helping work up some of the policies in the plan. We've got some of the team here. Um, so hopefully it'll be a really interesting and enjoyable session and we'll give you a chance to really get involved and ask some questions and point you in the right direction of where we're going to be uh, able to feed into the plan. So I'll make a start now, um, so I'm just going to remove my screen share, and hopefully you should be able to see us all, so welcome to you all, unfortunately we can't see you. Um, we're doing, the webinar is an hour long, and we're going to try and make it um, as interactive as possible, so you can ask questions all the way through, um, it is being recorded, so what we can do is we can have that up on our website afterwards, so you will be able to re-watch it, and we will pick up other questions that we haven't been able to answer during um, the session and we'll put them on our FAQs on the website where you can find them there. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel now and I'll go around to them individually and they can introduce themselves in fact. So I'm going to go around by my screen. Anna. Oh, hello everyone. Um, my name's Anna McKenzie. I work with Etude and um, I worked on formulating some of the buildings policies um, that we've recommended within our evidence base to support the local plan. Thank you, Anna, and it's really lovely to have you along this evening. Thanks for coming. Emma? Davis, I'm Principal Sustainability Officer for the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service, so working with colleagues to develop new climate change policies. Thank you, Emma, and welcome all this evening as well. Marina? Hi there, I'm Marina Goodyear. I'm a Senior Project Officer at Bioregional. I've been working with Anna and Emma to uh, put together the evidence base for net zero carbon. Um, how that might be defined, and I'll be talking about that a little more in a moment. Thank you very much, Marina, and welcome along tonight. Thanks for coming. And John, who's a dab hand at this by now, fourth webinar in, I think. Hello, uh, John Dixon, Planning Policy Manager for the Greater Cambridge Planning Service, and I help pull all the plan together and use this information that they help to prepare. Thanks, John, for being at this one as well. Um, Nancy. Hello, uh, my name is Nancy Kimberley. I'm a Principal Planning Policy Officer. And I've been working on the water topic area, the local plan. Thank you, Nancy, and great to have you. And last but not least, Elliot, we'll come to you. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Elliot Gill. I work for a consulting firm called Stantec, and I've been working with Nancy on the Integrated Water Management Study for Cambridge. Thanks, Elliot, and thank you for joining us again tonight. Um, and behind the scenes, we've got um, we've got Will Smeaton. Without Will, we wouldn't be doing this at all because he's running all of the technology tonight um, for us. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we can uh, we can stay um, stay online live with you. My name's Paul Frayner. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Assistant Director for Strategy and Economy across both councils. So you're part of the plan making team, um, been running these webinars as well. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what the session is going to look like, and then I'm going to hand over to colleagues. So this session, we're going to talk a little bit about the role of planning in responding to climate change um, and then get, some, get into some detail around net zero and carbon and plan making. We are going to do a little interactive session in the middle. We have run a couple of these already. It will be using something called Menti for those of you who are familiar or Mentimeter. I'm starting to get it shortened myself now. Um, so hopefully that will break up the session and mean that we don't talk about you for too long. And then we'll finish off with water. And then we'll have about 15 minutes for, for an actual panel Q&A later on as well. Please do, as I said, put your um, questions in the chat and some of the team will answer them as we're going along as well. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Emma now, who's going to start the presentation. Emma. Okay, thanks, Paul. So I thought I would just start off um, this evening by giving you a bit of an overview of the role of planning in responding to climate change and what we've tried to cover in the first proposals document. So we wanted to really make sure that the local plan included a kind of wide range of policies that recognise the role that, that planning and placemaking 
has to play in responding to climate change. So thinking about reducing carbon emissions, but also thinking about kind of climate resilience and adapting to the changing climate that we know is going to happen um, over the next few years. So within the first proposals document, we've got a section on climate change and also water, and that covers a wide range of, of policy areas which we've tried to kind of illustrate on this slide. So we've got policies that are there to support renewable energy generation. So that's going to be a really important aspect of getting, I suppose, greater Cambridge as a whole, so Cambridge and South Cambridgeshire, to net zero carbon. So we wanted to have quite a supportive policy approach within the document around that. We've also got within here kind of a new area for us, which we haven't really touched on before in, in planning policy, but we've got some um, policies around looking at using materials that have a low embodied carbon, which is another really important element of net zero carbon. It's not just about energy used in buildings, but it's about how you construct those buildings and the materials that you use to construct those buildings. We've also, we're looking to kind of develop a policy on circular economy, which is again, another area which we've not really touched on before within planning, but certainly an area that we think is worthy of inclusion in the local plan and developing something around, you know, how the built environment become, can become more circular. What I would say on embodied carbon, that is quite a new and an emerging area kind of nationally as well as locally. So I would say what we've got at the moment is a kind of placeholder about uh, reporting on embodied carbon, but recognising that that's a kind of rapidly moving area. So it may be as we're developing the plan, things like targets around embodied carbon might become clearer. So that might be an area that we can develop in a little bit more detail as we go through the plan making process. We've then also got a net zero carbon buildings policy within the first proposals document. It's quite a detailed emerging policy because we felt it needed to be. And we've got Marina and, and Anna here who are going to go into that in a little bit more detail shortly in terms of how we developed that policy and why we developed that policy. Another really important role as well for planning is it's important that the plan supports the switch to sustainable transport and also low emissions vehicles. So you've probably already heard in some of the previous webinars around the, the spatial strategy that we've developed in terms of where we're looking to locate growth and how the carbon associated with transport has been a really integral part of informing that spatial strategy. So what we're trying to do is focus development on locations that are already well served by sustainable modes of transport and also kind of encourage people to, to get out of their car more and use other modes of transport, particularly things like cycling. So that's been a really important element that's kind of been integral to shaping the first proposals document. We're then looking at setting some very stringent standards in the plan around water efficiency. And we've got Nancy and John who are going to cover that in a little bit more detail a little further along in this presentation. And then the final kind of area that we look at, and it's a really important one not to overlook. I think when you start talking about net zero carbon, it's very easy to forget that our climate is going to change because of the emissions that we've already released into the atmosphere. So another really important policy area for us is around climate change adaptation and making sure that our communities can adapt to the changing climate that we are that we're already starting to see, uh, to be perfectly honest. So we've got policies within the, um, the plan or emerging policies around the role of green infrastructure, the role of sustainable drainage, and also a fairly new area that's become quite important over the last few years, looking at the issue of overheating in new buildings, which is becoming increasingly apparent and looking at ways that we can design out those risks of overheating in buildings, but also thinking about the spaces around those buildings and how we can perhaps green our built environment more to help combat issues such as the urban heat island effect. 
So I think without further ado now, I'm going to hand over to Marina and Anna, and they're going to take you through some of our net zero carbon evidence base and a little bit more detail. Thanks very much, Emma. That was a great intro um, and definitely sets us up well for what we're going to go into. And um, so uh, just to, to recap, we are um, the consultants who produce the, the policy approach um, and based on a specific approach to defining what net zero carbon can and should mean for the local plan. So just to introduce ourselves, um, Bioregionals and Environmental Charity with experience in all around sustainability, sustainable construction and policy making all the way up from local to international level. Um, Etude is an engineering firm with expertise in energy construction and architecture. We also were joined by two other organisations in this work um, who were of immense help and those are Curry and Brown, who are quantity surveyors and cost consultants with experience in advising central and local government on the cost implications of the transition to low carbon or zero carbon. Um, also Mode, who are transport planners. Um, right, so our task was essentially to try to give Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service the information it needs about carbon to make decisions about where to allow that new growth to happen. So what are the implications in terms of building size and transport carbon? And also thinking a little bit about, um, about landscape as well. Uh, and secondly, what kind of local plan policies within existing planning powers would enable that transition to a zero carbon greater Cambridge, which is the, the overall goal. Um, and that zero carbon greater Cambridge is going to have to fit within a zero carbon or a net zero carbon UK as a whole. So uh, next slide, please. I wanted to, before we dive into the specifics, to just give everyone an overview of the full suite of tasks that we went through. Um, and the, in the diagram, the ones marked in orange are the ones that we will or can cover parts about today. Um, but I'll just run through these. So firstly, we wanted to define what does net zero carbon mean, both for the, the whole area and for individual buildings? Why do we need it? Um, how do we measure it? And what powers does the local plan really have to make it possible or to enable it? Uh, secondly, exploring the different levels of carbon emissions that will occur or that we can expect to occur depending on where the local plan allows the new growth to happen. Thirdly, what kind of carbon reduction targets should we be aiming for for Greater Cambridge and what kind of standards of new buildings and energy would enable this? And uh, Anna let that work. Um, fourthly, the technical feasibility of building zero carbon new buildings now, as in uh, there's lots of people calling for this and, and a lot of developers that are, are, are kind of terrified and, and thinking that it's not possible. So we wanted to test that. Um, next, we wanted to look at the, the cost implications of building to those standards, which we identified. Um, task F was then exploring whether there's any credibility or use in, in the offsetting concept, whether that could form a planning lever to get us towards that uh, net zero carbon greater Cambridge as a whole. Um, and then finally, we did do some stakeholder engagement as well with some small groups um, about uh, coming up to a year ago now, I think. From all of that, we developed a sort of suite of policy suggestions, which Emma and John and the others have been um, honing and working with and, and working out what they can uh, use and implement. Uh, and there is also a non-technical summary of all of this work available online as well, uh, if anyone's wanting to dig in a bit more into it after this webinar. So that's, uh, that was our work. That's our, our full set of tasks. Um, next slide, please. Thanks very much. So um, firstly, why do we need to achieve net zero carbon in the UK and Greater Cambridge and um, at, at uh, individual developments? Firstly, um, as Emma has already touched upon, we've already been putting a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. Climate change is already happening. Uh, there has been a one degree Celsius rise in average temperatures today um, compared to the pre-industrial period. Uh, and there is, and Anna will cover this in a little bit more detail later, there is a limited amount of carbon that we can emit between now and a certain date before we will tip the planet over um, a really dangerous level of, of climate change. Responding to that danger, the International Paris Agreement in 2015 um, were, was uh, by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The UK is a signatory to that. That commitment um, commits the UK and all other signatories to re uh, limit climate change to well below two degrees uh, Celsius of uh, global average temperature increases. And uh, as I've mentioned, on one degree of that is already gone and to try to attempt a limit of, of 1.5. Um, the second really interesting part about the Paris Agreement is that it contains the equity principle. 
And this means that countries like the UK, which are richer and have more technological ability, have a greater responsibility to pursue deeper and quicker cuts to our carbon emissions, specifically our carbon emissions per person. Under that agreement, the UK also has to report its uh, annual greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that is done by the Committee on Climate Change. Within the UK, we've had legislation about carbon reduction since uh, about 2008 with the Climate Change Act, which committed the UK to reduce its carbon emissions by 80% between 1990 to 2050. Um, that was updated in 2019 to be net zero carbon. So that's this target everyone is chasing. Uh, and that's uh, where all of this stems from really. At a more local level, um, the both local authorities of Greater Cambridge have uh, sort of declared climate emergency. Um, South Cambridgeshire in particular has, has, as part of that, made a pledge that all strategic decisions, um, including planning decisions, will be in line with that shift to zero carbon. So those are the drivers. And if we could have the next slide, please. Great. So then what does net zero carbon mean? Um, so firstly, um, carbon gets, is used as a, a sort of catch-all term for a few different gases. There are a range of greenhouse gases. They um, are emitted in different amounts and they have different climate impacts. Um, carbon dioxide being the main one, as you can see in the sort of pie chart in the top right there, um, but other, other greenhouse gases are emitted in smaller amounts um, but, but can sometimes have bigger effects um, per kilogram emitted. So at a global level, essentially net zero carbon means Greenhouse gases in equals greenhouse gases out. So that human caused emissions of greenhouse gases are balanced by an equal amount of removals. And those removals could be um, by uh, green infrastructure, or it could be in the future, maybe it, there might be technologies for that as well, but they don't exist yet um, in a scalable way. At a smaller scale, so if you want to have a net zero carbon place building organization or person, then that place building organization or person needs to prevent or remove an equal amount of greenhouse gas as it emits. And to understand that, we need a carbon accounting methodology. So it's basically whose carbon is it anyway, who's responsible for what, and, and how do we keep track of that? So to explore this topic, we reviewed a number of methodologies. There are methodologies for organizational carbon accounting, um, and there are a number of methodologies for um, the carbon accounts of, of a whole area, like Greater Cambridge, like, uh, like Cambridge City, like South Cambridgeshire. Um, and you can see a list of the ones that we reviewed there. Um, there are also methodologies and guides to, to try to account for the carbon emissions of an individual building as well. Um, and again, you, you've got a list of them there and they are sort of more or less effective on, on different topics. And we weren't reviewing these to try to say, you should use this method or you should use that method, but more to look at the consensus of what should or shouldn't be included in a local area's carbon emissions. Um, or a building's carbon emissions, uh, if we're trying to get that to net zero and be able to track that. Um, so uh, yeah, we looked at all of these together and I'll just explain the diagram on the bottom right. That diagram is from the GHG protocol for cities, which is poss possibly the, um, the best recognized local area carbon accounting method. Um, and it divides these into three scopes. So scope one is the emissions coming from directly within your area. Um, and that can come from a variety of sources. So that's um, burning fuel, but either for transport or for, um, for buildings. It can come from agriculture, waste, wastewater. It can come from industrial processes. Scope two is your grid supplied energy, which probably comes partly from generation inside your area and partly from outside it. And scope three is stuff that um, your activities will influence, but which you didn't emit directly. Um, so essentially those three scopes are reflecting how responsible you are for each set of carbon emissions. So that's the scopes and the methodologies. If we can have the next slide, please. Great. So long story short, I'm not going to go into the detail of each of those methodologies. They do differ in terms of which gases and which sources they include. Um, but our consensus, and also relating back to what the local plan can do about it, was that the definition of a net zero carbon greater Cambridge should include all greenhouse gases and their sources in scope one and scope two. We should monitor and seek to reduce scope three, but we shouldn't really expect to reduce this to zero with certainty. And that's because there's just so much estimation involved in working out what your scope three emissions would be. It's uh, tracking the data is just, it, it, it's close to impossible to do it with real robustness in a way that you could hold developers to account for it, put it that way. Um, 
Secondly, this definition of a net zero carbon greater Cambridge should be principally based on real reductions. We shouldn't just be throwing money outside the county to, to make it someone else's problem and say, oh, they're going to reduce or, or remove emissions on our behalf. It should be based on real reductions just because there isn't the scope to actually achieve enough, as many offsets as we would need. Um, those offsets, if we do use any, they should never be from outside the UK because that wouldn't count towards the UK's net zero carbon status really. Um, and to achieve that, essentially, we need new buildings to be net zero carbon in their energy use now. We need them not to use fossil fuel on site. We need them to be located to minimise the transport emissions um, and to enable uh, low carbon or zero carbon vehicles for basically any car use that you can expect there to be. Um, they need to be, this is a kind of tangential point, but they need to probably be located to try and not to damage the, the major carbon sinks that Greater Cambridge already has. So if there's peatland or if there's a forest that could be continually removing carbon, we should avoid building on those. Um, and then finally, keep track of and take steps to reduce the embodied carbon. And that's the, uh, the carbon that was involved in producing, transporting and constructing the materials to make those buildings. Right, because that mostly falls within scope three. There are a lot of other steps that will need to be taken, not directly relating to, to new buildings. Um, and those are kind of listed at the bottom in terms of massively upscaling renewables, uh, large scale renewables, making that happen within Greater Cambridge to a, a reasonable extent, um, investing in transport infrastructure and restoring green infrastructure as well. But part uh, covering buildings is, is in the bullet points. So uh, next slide, please. Great, and I'll try to be fairly quick on this one. So um, there are a number of duties and powers that apply to what we're, the local plan is, is meant to achieve really. Um, and there are powers, but also limits to those powers in terms of what it's allowed to do um, in terms of reducing carbon emissions. So number one, Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act requires that we have policies that as a whole secure that the development and use of land contribute to the mitigation of and adaptation to climate change. So that's the, the biggest driver of the planning duties. In the National Planning Policy Framework, we also need to apparently take a proactive approach, which is in line with the Climate Change Act. So with the Climate Change Act, which now requires net zero by 2050 across the country. Um, to do these things, we are empowered to set reasonable requirements for um, renewables in new builds and also energy efficiency standards um, that are better than that of the national building regulations. Energy efficiency standards is, well, the devil's in the detail, really. It is defined in that act as standards endorsed by the Secretary of State. Currently, only the building regulations, calculations count towards that. So we can require improvements on those, but it's a bit of a gray area whether we can require other methods to account for the energy use and carbon in the building. The extent of what is reasonable hasn't really been tested. So, I mean, from my point of view, as an environmental consultant, my instinct would be, the reasonable thing is net zero, uh, but it hasn't been legally tested. Um, and then beyond that, spatial distribution of growth, as we've discussed, is, is a key planning power, um, and we can require developer payments towards new infrastructure and mitigation of development impacts through the community infrastructure levy or section 106 agreements. However, all of the above have to be justified with robust evidence of need and, and being able to be implemented. So I think, that is the end of my section. I may be handing to Anna in just a moment. Can we have the next slide, please? There we go. I'll hand over to Anna to talk about carbon budgets, reductions, and building specs. Thank you, Marina, um, and hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to try and explain briefly in about five minutes how we have ended up recommending and why we've recommended the, um, the targets within the net zero carbon buildings policies that we have. And to do that, I just wanted to sort of take you back to what Marina was saying and, and let's look at what are we really trying to achieve. And so as Marina said, we're trying to achieve, and as you all probably know, um, we're trying to limit global temperature rises to um, within one and a half and two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And um, simultaneous to that, the UK has its net zero carbon by 2050 target. And one of the things I really want to talk about today is 
the concept, this concept of carbon budgets, because it's so important to understand, and it's and it's and it's really a, a backbone to why we're suggesting the ambition of the buildings policy, and also the pace at which it's implemented. Uh, because getting to zero carbon by 2050 alone does not necessarily guarantee that we are Paris Agreement aligned. So next, next slide, please. Um, so the IPCC and climate scientists have shown that there is a real direct proportion, there's a, there's a direct proportion between the cumulative carbon in the atmosphere and the temperatures, surface temperatures we're seeing. So that's really useful because essentially we can get, we can understand if we want to limit to one and a half or two degrees, how much carbon in the future in, in the atmosphere to get to that point. So next slide, please. So the um, IPCC has worked out, we have a global carbon budget of 900,000 megatons for a 50-50 chance of reaching 1.7 degrees. It's a little bit of uncertainty. And so they give various sort of statistics for different temperatures and different amounts. But so as you can see, 50-50 chance of 1.7 is not exactly ambitious. It's a bit give or take, it's kind of fingers crossed. Um, and the Tyndall Center has done some really amazing work on apportioning the UK and every local authority within it, its share of that global carbon budget. Um, next slide, please. So here we have a graph which um, shows the annual emissions, so from between 2020 and 2050. So this is just a a graphic it's 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 uh it's not indicative of anyone's particular pathway or but what what it shows is that essentially you've got if we carry on emitting so we've got this horizontal line we're carrying on emitting at the same pace we are now and then we have a sort of fairly steep drop off in the mid 2030s um the area underneath the graph that represents the amount of carbon we've emitted the blue shading is the amount the global the carbon budget of greater cambridge all the orange isn't a carbon overspend. So Greater Cambridge, for example, it has 11 megatons of CO2 in its carbon budget. That's, that's the amount you can emit between now and any point in the future before you're contributing effectively more than um, 1.7 degrees. So um, at your annual emissions rate, now that annual, annual emissions rate was pre-2020, and these figures are from 2020, and you'd, you'd end up using it by 2026, 2027, if you don't reduce your carbon now. So that's, I really wanted to make that clear. Um, next slide, please. So what sort of trajectories should we be looking at? Well, if you were just looking at an annual reduction, you'd probably be looking at something like 13.5% per year or 50% every five years. And that would give you a trajectory that you can see on the left. But it's in practice quite unlikely that that's going to happen. It's such a big, you know, big drop so soon. You're probably more going to end up with a sort of backwards S curve of slower emissions and then Faster, faster emissions will be required, but really that that curve can take any shape it any shape it but provided the area underneath doesn't exceed the carbon budget. So um, I, that's just the point I wanted to make because clearly we can't just sort of wait and say, well, we don't need to be zero carbon by twenty fifty. We don't need to implement these zero carbon policies until the next local plan, or maybe we could have stepped stepped um, approach between now and then to be kind to developers. If we want to be Paris compliant, we have to be ambitious with zero carbon policies now. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, what do we need to do? What do buildings need to do? Well, they have to stop burning gas. And that, that's really important. We need to stop putting that carbon into the atmosphere. So the alternatives are direct electrics at the moment, the, the alternatives available right now, and that, that's also important. We need to be using technology that's available now. And that low carbon technology that's available now is direct electric heating and air source heat pumps, both of which use electricity. Of course, there is electricity within the grid, and but this is the grid, national grid is decarbonizing quite rapidly. And um, we have some really good predictions from the national grid to show that um, hopefully in future years, maybe in the even in the 2030s, we're going to get to net zero carbon electricity. There's an exclamation mark against direct electric heating, because that's just to show that 
um, it does use a lot more electricity than an SLC pump would, and therefore it puts more strain on the grid. So some caution needs to be viewed around that. Next, next slide, please. So the metrics that we're essentially, we've essentially recommended go into the policy are um, a space heating demand of 15 to 20 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. So essentially that just means very efficient building fabric, it means ultra efficient building fabric of approximately passive house levels. It's been recommended by the Committee on Climate Change. It's also recommended within the Letty, Letty's definition of net zero carbon. And one of the practical and technical benefits of this, it, it, your, your building kind of acts like a bit like a storage heater. You can be really flexible about when you heat it. And that's really important because as we move towards an electrified economy, we are going to be putting a lot more strain on the grid. The grid isn't currently um, at the, where it needs to be. So it's going to have to improve and ramp up. And if we, um, if we can even out those peak heat demands by different people's heating turning on at different times, we just enable that transition much more than if um, we had less energy efficient buildings are so all requiring more heat in those peak winter demands and those coldest times. Um, the second metric we're looking at is the total energy use of buildings. So that's the amount of energy that's needed for everything. So, you know, your, your appliances, your cooking, your lighting, um, your hot water and your heating. So it's everything. Um, we've selected 35 kilowatt hours per meter square per year. Um, that's in line with the Letty net, net zero definition. And the way they calculated that was they really looked at the national, at a national level, how much electricity can the national grid provide? And they sort of worked out what share each home should be targeting. So there's a sort of science-based uh, reason to that figure. Um, and again, it's low because it helps the grid, it reduces those peak demands on the grid. And finally, the, the third sort of key aspect of this in terms of operational carbon is achieving an energy balance. And simply that just means that the home or the building should generate as much energy, renewable energy in a year as it consumes. Um, and the benefits of that are, and this, yeah, thank you very much. This, this just shows that. So all those energy uses that you use in a building are balanced by the amount of renewable energy. And the benefits of that are, we're contributing to renewable energy in the national grid, which is what we need to do, but there's also some real benefits for homeowners as well. So they get to benefit, they can use that electricity directly if they want to. Um, most people are probably going to end up moving over to electric cars, so you can use them to charge your car, um, reduce energy bills, have a, some sort of export tariff potentially, and um, so many other benefits. And next slide, please. So what we did is we did some modeling with Passive House Planning Package. We used, um, we used that because it's been shown to be really sort of quite reliably predict how much the build a building will use in real life, as opposed to the compliance-based uh, modeling that you need for building regulations, which tend not to have much correlation to how much building reuses really in real life. So um, we tested those metrics across four different buildings. And all these, these plans and these buildings were taken from planning applications that had been made within Greater Cambridge. And we just literally took them exactly as they were. Didn't make any amendments to them. Um, we did, we tested two different heat sources, heat pump and um, direct electric. And you can see this is showing for the heat pump. For all those metrics, we were able to achieve um, the target set with varying levels of fabric efficiency. Um, there's an exclamation mark against the terrace house because um, that was uh, a, a little bit more challenging to achieve. Things like dormer windows do actually increase the heat loss quite a lot. And what we did find uh, um, was that um, through optimizing certain design elements, then you, you can, it's easier to meet the targets. It's also cheaper to meet the targets. And that's really, that's something that's quite interesting really that we found. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is, this was the results using a um, direct electric heating system. So again, we were able to achieve, um, obviously the fabric didn't change. So we were able to achieve that space heating demand target on, on the top. 
it was not possible to meet the overall energy use intensity target using direct electric heating. And that's because it uses three times as much electricity to heat a home than SLC heat pumps do. So that overall energy use grew quite substantially. Um, as a result, it's also harder to achieve that net zero balance. So if you're using more energy, um, you need to generate more energy to get that net zero balance. And for this terraced house, for example, because of that dormer and the, or the particular orient orientation of this home, we weren't able to achieve that net zero balance on the site for that um, for that type. But I think one of the, I think what we found was if we're targeting 35, it really does kind of rule out indirectly direct electric heating. So um, people would almost certainly need to be installing um, SLC heat pumps to get there. Um, and yeah, and, and that's it. We, we did do the cost modeling too, and we found we had some uplifts of between seven and 13%. We've also modeled this on other projects too, and they've come in lower than that. But I think um, one thing that was really, really clear was it's it changing the design and optimizing the design of the building form really has an impact on how much the uplift is. And so, designers right from the beginning can minimize those costs with the uplift required to meet those targets just by paying some attention to how the building's designed and the, the details within it and that's that's the end of my part thank you very much for listening Anna Marina that was incredibly interesting and, and really detailed and I know we've run over a little bit but I think that it's really important to give that time I know that there's quite a lot of detail in there but you know, this is all fairly new stuff, I'd say very new stuff, but it's something that we've really got to get a grip with. And it's, it's you know, this is the kind of the foundational work, really. We've heard a lot of conversation, I suppose, over COP26, but this is the real work that's happening at a bottom up level that really needs to start taking place and things that local government can actually do and put in place to start dealing with these issues. So I thank you for the presentation. We will have got a little bit of an interactive session. I'm happy to run over a little bit as well if people are happy to stay if you've got extra questions. There's not a huge amount of questions coming through. It's quite a few, only a few of you tonight. Um, maybe it's the timing. So we'll try and get through all of them, I would think, at the moment, unless a big influx comes through. We've got a little bit of an interactive session for you now. As I said um, before, if you scan that QR code, or um, I think at the, at the, on the next screen, there's a... a, um, a details for Mentimeter. If you go to Mentimeter and you put the, co the code in, scan that QAR code, or you go to this code at the top there, I think it's showing, is that showing the, the, the little code there at the top panel? I don't know if they can see it. Yeah, we can see the web address and the code. Thank you guys, that's helpful to know. I can't see it because the Zoom stuff is at the top of my screen. So. Just to get you thinking about, I mean, it's really lift it up a level. You've heard a lot of detail there, but what we also need to know is how we can, you know, feed some of your thoughts into the plan. And, and this is a question that we'd, we'd like to ask you really before we move on to water. And, you know, this may be things that can be dealt with in the planning system. It may be things that are dealt out with outside of it, but from your own perspectives and, you know, listening to some of the conversation about the planning, but also the facts, the kind of quite dark facts that we've got to get to, net zero and how we might get there or might not get there. What do you think are the most important things that we can do to address climate change? Now, I think if you put some of your thoughts into the Mentimeter, they will start popping up on my screen and we can just have a little discussion around them. I mean, as I say, we've run a couple of these over the last three or four sessions, but we have had a lot of a bigger group really. So if there's not too much coming through, I'll move straight on. But um, if there's any thoughts that, from a high level perspective panel, any things that are coming up? Yeah, we've got a few coming through. So net zero homes, and we've talked about that a little bit. Um, the reduction in car use, and I think um, both Emma, I think Emma touched upon this in terms of our strategy is designed around, you know, thinking about transport and thinking about the best places to put, you know, development to put growth, to put houses near jobs, so people are reduc reducing those those, you know, those car journeys. Any thoughts on any of those from the panel? We were actually discussing the act now point um, before we started. And I think the short answer is we, we are, but plan making does take a long time in order to bring in standards like this, which go beyond the national standards set out in, in, in you know, national guidance. 
we need to test them and go through the local plan process, which unfortunately does take a number of years. But Emma, we are already taking action, aren't we, with our current plans we, and we, current approaches to try and do what we can now. Yeah, we are. We're already, we've already got policies in our plans that require carbon reduction that goes beyond current building regulations. But what we're already starting to see is a lot of developers are already moving away from gas. Not all of them, but quite a lot of them are. So they're already starting to look at the use of air source heat pumps, that sort of technology. There are already some developers out there that are referring to some of the standards that we've talked about as well. So we're seeing people starting to use the LETI standards. We're getting a lot more passive house developments coming forwards now as well. And I think that's driven quite a lot by colleges and University of Cambridge. But we're starting to see some of those standards. We're starting to see embodied carbon being reported on and you know people are using there's the Reba climate challenge as well which sets some targets so we are making progress I would love to go further faster but as John says you know we do have to work within the plan making process um, I think as well if I could also pick up on the retrofit and I've seen that there is a question in the Q&A about the local plan and retrofitting what we found with the existing local plan for Cambridge where we have a retrofit policy we're finding it really hard to actually implement through planning because planning isn't really set up to deal with retrofits it's kind of more of an issue for building control but it's not really properly picked up through building control either um, so it's it's not an ideal system to use to deal with retrofit because a lot of the stuff that you do to retrofit a home doesn't require planning permission. But what I would say is I know that Cambridge City Council, um, working actually with Bioregional, are currently developing a retrofit guide to net zero carbon. So they're going to be publishing early part of next year a handbook for, for homeowners that will take you through how you can retrofit towards net zero carbon for some of the common house types and archetypes that we see in Cambridge. Yeah, it's really interesting also to see, I mean, you know, and you make the distinction there with retrofitting and the power of planning policy. And because this is an area that we do know, it transcends a number of different places that need to be involved in this. And I think, you know, retrofit is one of those areas, but there's a big, you know, a big point around behaviour change here, which is obviously not a planning issue. But again, it needs to be something that's considered in the round because, you know, the way that we think about, you know, people moving around in cars, the way that they heat their home, the choices that people make around consumption. I mean, you mentioned about the circular economy earlier, Emma, as well, and, the, you know, really crucial point. I think the kind of the major policies that we're bringing forward around, you know, the kind of reuse of stuff or the potential use of, of materials again and, I think this is stuff that needs to be considered in the round as well, because it's not just something that is within the gift of planning. Planning has a huge part to play in it. But for me, and I've done a couple of these recently, I think the biggest message is that this needs to be done in collaboration with you know, other areas, other parts of government, other organisations. You know, It's a collaborative piece and we're not going to solve these problems on our own. I'm going to move on because we're quite we're quite far into time now. I mean, there's not a huge amount of questions coming through, so we will pick those up. We're going to move into water because it is a really critical issue in this area, and we would have been usually an entire session on it. But um, I think that we really do want to touch on it in detail. So um, I'm going to hand over to John, who's going to pick up on some of these. And John and Nancy, do you want to pick these up, and we'll do questions at the end. So this is a slide that we've used um, in a number of the webinars so far um, because it's such an important issue for the plan um we've been quite clear that um the plan and the level of growth that's been identified in the proposals for consultation is dependent on there being uh, water supply available without causing uh, further harm uh, to the environment um we've almost been quite clear that that's contingent and that we haven't yet got the evidence um to understand that fully and i'll go into that in a second so it's almost a, a what the word is a caveat on the plan that we we still need to understand the role water plays um the biggest issue really is that um the great cambridge area gets uh well, largely most of its water from the uh, chalk aquifer south of cambridge and that aquifer is under pressure and doesn't have capacity 
to provide water uh, to supply for the growth. Indeed, the abstraction rates need to be reduced. Um, it's not as straightforward as thinking, um, well, don't develop, because we've also got responsibilities to respond to economic, social, environmental issues when planning. We need to respond and understand our objectives as needs. And if we can do so without causing you know, unacceptable environmental harm, we need to plan for them. So we have got to balance all of these issues. Um, so the slide really ends on saying, well, what are the consequences if we were to reduce that growth? So the first point would be, um, we would have to ask our neighbors to meet that growth for us. And that in itself has sustainability consequences. Clearly they're not meeting needs where they're generated could mean further issues of uh, commuting, for example. Um, and then it could be that if they can't make the need, you don't meet that development need at all, which has other consequences. So not helping um, providing enough housing, for example, so there are consequences to all of these issues. Um, and the next slide really go on to what, what is happening. So it's not something that the, the councils can deal with directly. And we need very much to work with partners, uh, the water industry, the government to look into how these issues are being resolved. And we commissioned um, an integrated water strategy to inform the plan. And that study continues to be developed. And one of the issues that particularly looks at is water supply. Um, and I think we skipped a slide there, Paul. Um, that's the one. So we need to wait and understand the process of water planning that is currently taking place. So at the regional level, um, water resources east are working with the water companies to develop a regional water plan for the area as looking at how they meet the needs of users, economic development and so on, whilst protecting the national environment. And they're exploring all the options that could be applied into how they can, can address the water supply needs issues for the long term. I think the plan would go up to 2050. Um, it's got a longer time of it's being prepared at slightly later timeline than our plan. So as you can see there, they're intended to carry out some consultation next year, but that final plan won't be available until 2023. So to some extent, we're still awaiting the outcome of that process. And the individual water companies will also be preparing their water resource management plans, which is their statutory process for identifying water and where it's gonna come from, how it's gonna be managed over the period. So we're expecting those to be updated as well. Now, the water uh, companies and Water Resources East actually did submit um, so, uh, a paper to us, which you can find in our integrated water management strategy in our document library. And it started to show some of the uh, measures which they're uh, exploring as to how they might be able to address supply issues. Next slide, please, Paul. Um, some of the options they're exploring are particularly uh, bringing forward new reservoirs in the east of England, um, potentially a, a, a Fen reservoir is at the very early stages of planning, and that could uh, significantly increase supplies to our area. And they're also exploring whether, in simple terms, Cambridge could be better, better connected up to the surrounding area. So are there other water resources in surrounding areas that could be brought in to help meet the needs of Cambridge and take the pressure off the aquifer. And there are other measures also being looked at. So how can you use water resources more efficiently, reduce leakage, all those things. So really we need to understand the outcome of that water planning process to understand whether the uh, level of need we've identified can be met sustainably and also when that can happen. So it might also affect the timing of delivery. Do we need to wait, for example, for the reservoirs to be available? Are there shorter term measures that can come in and meet that demand uh, in the shorter term? So there's a lot of unknowns at the moment, but we're very clear that we need to understand those issues before we move forward to the final stages of the plan. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, uh, Nancy. Thank you. Um, yeah, so John's run through sort of additional um, sources of water supply, which obviously are outside the remit that we can do as a local planning authority. 
Um, but within the first proposals, we do talk about um, policy, two sort of policy areas. One of them is having um, a very high water efficiency requirement in new development. And this slide shows that at the moment, sort of typical water use in Cambridge water area is 143 litres per person per day, um, which is sort of quite high, even in comparison to the 125 litres, which is the standard um, building regulations requirement for new housing. Within our current um, 2018 local plans, we already have a policy that's at a um, sort of more efficient level than that. Um, and, you know, within this area, it's been identified as an area of serious water stress. So we could um, use that level, um, which is an optional national building um, standard. But within the policy area, we actually want to go even further than that. So we're proposing 80 litres per person per day. Um, within the integrated water management study, um, that's shown that that is possible with water efficient fittings and fixtures, but you'd also have to use some sort of rainwater harvesting and potentially grey water um, within developments. But it doesn't add that much more to the cost of the development, and in particular those sort of um, reuse of water schemes particularly work best where it's a sort of larger development rather than um, kind of individual householder level. Um, next slide please. The other area that we've been looking at is flooding and integra integrated water management. So obviously we've picked our sites within the first proposals to avoid the areas of highest flood risk and the evidence is within the level one strategic flood risk assessment that um, Stantec has produced for us. And the other side of that is also to reduce the risk of flooding from any new developments. And particularly important within that is having sustainable drainage systems within new developments. And these have multiple benefits. They allow infiltration of water, they prevent sort of fast surface runoff, um, that goes straight into the rivers, but they also have benefits of sort of filtering water, so help to improve water quality, and they also have amenity and biodiversity benefits too. Particularly, we were sort of focusing on having that, in, that water should be looked at in an integrated way within all new developments, and this sort of diagram here shows that how everything can kind of connect, and that's the way that developers should be looking forward. Um, as to all those interactions between them. Next slide, please. And our evidence, as we've already spoken about in Elliot's here today, um, uh, is the integrated water management study. So we already have the outline water cycle study, which has an update at the end of that, um, sort of moving more towards the detailed water cycle study. And there's the strategic flood risk assessment, as I've said. And those are all within the document library on the website. Thanks very much, Nancy. And I think that we're at the end of the slides now. And um, I just put this slide up because this is where we're currently at in terms of our webinars. I mean, if you go to the website, you will see a number of, of the different in real life and other Zoom sessions that we've got on. All of these um, sessions will be recorded and they'll be up online. So the details plus the slideshows will always be there. So we have still got some questions in the Q&A and, and we'll pick them off now. I'm, I'm happy to go over if we do if we do um, run into any more. There are a lot of questions around growth and, and growth numbers in the, the um, chat. And we understand that this is a really sensitive issue for residents and, and communities around here as well. Um, and we have dealt with a lot of those conversations and a lot of the detail behind that in some of the previous sessions and the Q&As that can be found essentially on, online. Um, I just will deal with it once here as well, just to, for those who haven't heard and haven't had that detail. If you do want to find further detail, you can see it on the FAQs. Essentially, the issue around growth and the standard methodology at, at government level is that we, it is incumbent on us to identify the number of homes that we think are relevant to this particular area. Yes, there is a standard method of government. It's a standard methodology for the, across the UK. Cambridge is quite unique. Um, jobs growth here has been significant um, in previous history and is forecasted to be significant. There was a quite a, 
detailed piece of evidence work undertaken by a combined authority called the independent um, Cambridge and Peterborough Independent Economic Review, which you know, pushes even higher jobs numbers, which are, they feel is likely in the next few years. We have um, taken our own evidence on this because of that fact. Um, we do have to provide enough homes for the jobs. It's incumbent on us to do so because you know, planning policy and a local plan in particular is one of the most scrutinised statutory documents you can have. It's scrutinised independently in an examination in public at the end of the process by, um, by government and will be found to be sound or unsound on that basis. So we, if we haven't done our homework and if we haven't ticked all of the boxes and explored all of the options and planned as well as we possibly can, bearing in mind it's very uncertain, then that will be something that we will have to pick up at an examination and it is unlikely that we would have a sound plan if we hadn't explored the fact that Cambridge has a very high economic growth level and that is likely to continue irrespective of what we do with the plan so we do have to plan for that and um, I think it's important to understand and if you want to look in detail at that that obviously you know the impacts of not planning for enough development is it, is it, you know development will happen growth, jobs growth will happen irrespective the impacts will be that you know longer distance commuting commuting, worsening affordability, um, insufficient or uncoordinated infrastructure and the inability for us to be able to pay for the things that we need to pay from that development obligation through section 106 or SIL or whatever the new methodology for infrastructure levy might be. Um, so it's really important to have a sound plan that sets out the framework to deliver a sustainable development framework for the future. And, you know, I think that that's, that's we've done a, a very, very thorough job on that. And, and um, I think, you know, there are, we understand all of the issues with it. We are planning for, you know, up to 2041 and that growth that might happen in there. Um, so let's go to another question in here. Um, why is clean tech employment not recognised in the first proposals? Now, I'm going to come to you for that, John, because I'm not sure we look at particular sectors, but um, have, any thoughts on that? So our plan has been informed by uh, another study which looked at um, economic development and the economic needs of the area because national guidance requires us to uh, respond to employment needs, providing a, a, a flexible and you know, good supply of employment land. And that work demonstrated that we have got uh, a strong supply of employment land across a range of locations of a range of types. Now, we haven't necessarily identified um, sites for every specific type or, of, of employment, but I think what we've demonstrated, we have got a strong and flexible supply of employment. So clean tech firms could locate and do locate in a number of locations where there is capacity for, for further growth employment. So I hope that the plan will continue to support those sectors going forward. Thanks, John. Um, I'm going to... To, going to come down here, but there's this one here, Mar a Marina Goodyear slide, one of your slides, M Marina. Um, defining net zero carbon for local plan purposes, talking about carbon offsetting. Now, I don't think we got to carbon offsetting. I think we've got a few slides that we had in the bag and we'll add them to the, the slide pack at the end as well, it goes on the website. But if you would fancy explaining that, Marina, that'd be, be interesting if you could just give a quick explainer of that. Uh, yeah, sure thing. So actually, I already started typing, but I'm happy to go live instead. That's fine. Um, so essentially, ideally, we would want those offsets to be delivered according to the following hierarchy. Firstly, avoid having to offset in the first place, deliver your carbon reductions on site to the greatest possible extent. Secondly, within Greater Cambridge, because then that's helping to deliver a net zero carbon Greater Cambridge under that scope one and scope two definition that we discussed. Thirdly, it definitely shouldn't be outside the UK essentially because that won't help to deliver a net zero carbon UK, which is what we have to achieve by 2050. I suppose it, it could also be within um, a wider Cambridgeshire context, if, if desired, if it couldn't be done within Greater Cambridge. And I know that there are some people in the, the county council who are doing some interesting work on um, working out possibly a county-wide offsetting scheme and what that could be spent on. And I know that they've, um, they've already had some experience um, delivering, for example, uh, using some money to transition the entire small village from oil heating to a, a village-wide district heat network, I believe. Um, so they could be used within the wider county, but ideally within Greater Cambridge and never outside the UK. There would be our two sort of parameters for that. I hope that helps. Thanks, Marina. I'm sure that was very helpful. 
We have got another couple of questions left, about, about one minute left. So, so if you have got questions, people are still here, please please do put them in the chat. We're happy to answer them. Um, so just one, I'm again on the growth issues, you know, um, so if jobs growth will happen, why propose more employment land to the south of our homes are planned for the north? Just to answer to that one, I mean, we ran a whole strategy session, I think last week, and that goes into some detail around, um, you know, the, the kind of rationale um, for the sites that we're proposing and, and the way that they relate between the relationship between those homes and jobs. But if anything further you wanted to add to that, John, I can put the link up at the end of the, so we've got the link to where you can find that information in further detail. Uh, no, I would end up repeating the strategy section, which is very much we sought to focus growth, uh, where jobs, homes and transport worked work together through a, a, a clearly set out strategy. So I won't seek to repeat that session again. Thanks, John. Um, another quick question here on water neutrality, um, potential option. Emma, are you happy to pick this one up? Uh, does Elliot want to pick this one up? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Elliot's here. I forget. I can't see Elliot at the bottom of my screen. He's <laughs> up at the bottom. I'm really sorry, Elliot. Come, come in. Please. <coughs> Hello, and thanks for your question, Kira. I was just starting to talk, but I can talk to you live. Um, uh, it's a tricky one. Um, neutrality in the strictest terms means you compensate for new people by asking the people that live there already to use less and our problem is the levers we have to encourage the existing population to use less there, there are very few and it's all down to personal behavior and motivation so i would you know suggest an alternative interpretation of this word water neutrality is that we try and replace um, or we introduce new drinking water into the area from outside so that we can water more people without causing any additional detriment in fact recovering the current detriment to the new population and to the river i guess the other issue is that part of ooh, part of using water um efficiently the the standards nancy showed um previously is also about using gray water for tasks that you know we don't need to use that very very highly processed drink precious drinking water for so i think that's where we've focused our money dare i say our, our requirements in the plan on making sure we get our dwellings as efficiently as possible that's the most effective way we can do through the plan we think yeah thanks. So, and, and whilst um providing new water efficient buildings is not not more costly than normal buildings might be retrofitting that technology into the existing housing base is, is much more challenging thank you elliot thank you john as well um so just two questions left and then we'll we'll, we'll um we'll finish up so i'll just pick up that last growth question around the leveling up i mean you know for warrant of not really being in a place to be able to comment on the government's plans for leveling up I mean, I think the key point for us is it's, you know, we are two districts, we're a district in the city, we are local planning authorities, we have to provide a local plan for this area. And, um, you know, we can have a conversation about the role of strategic planning and we may see some, you know, some, some uh, news on that coming out of government over the next few weeks and months in response to the white paper um, but you know the strategic planning issues could potentially have a have a role in helping you know disperse some of that in a more effective way over a longer period but the current position for us is that we are preparing a local plan for greater cambridge and it's incumbent on us to prepare that for the needs of this area currently so so you know i think that we can discuss those other things in the round as they appear um i'm just going to come to a I'm going to open this up to the whole panel because I don't know the answer to it, um, certainly, but it could the principles adopted in relation to carbon offsetting also be applied to water supply? Um, that is an interesting question and something I have no idea what the answer might be. And I can see some people's heads and brains working. So I think that's that's really the concept of water neutrality, Paul, where you would seek to effectively offset the water demand that you increase from development by reducing the demand from existing development. I think, as Elliot said, the experience is very difficult to do because you have to then get into people's homes, other people's homes effectively to make those improvements, which is actually very difficult to do. You'd need water company involvement and so on. I think up and down the country, some of the research that we looked at, I think working with Elliot on the 
uh, the study was that there, there's very few examples of making it worse successfully. So that the best approaches are to try and minimize the water you actually use in the first place. And that's really what we're focused on at the moment. But it, it's a really interesting point, but it, a difficult one. Definitely. And I think Marina wants to add a couple of points in there as well, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, I'm just going to stick my nose in on the topic that's not really mine as I'm, I'm carbon team rather than water team. But um, just a, a small thought on that topic. I can't say I can't speak for this specific water supply area, but I have worked on developments in other areas. So, for example, Thames water supply area and the affinity water supply area. Um, and I just want to note that um, there's really shocking leakage rates on a lot of those places. And again, I don't know if that applies in the same way to the Greater Cambridge area. But for example, in the Thames water area, uh, last time I checked their water reports, I think about 25% of what they put in the pipes is just lost to leaks before it gets to anyone's tap. So I wonder if that could be something. I mean, theoretically, the water company themselves should be fixing that, and they are all making huge efforts to fix it. But um, I wonder if that's a, a way to sort of do the offsetting without having to fiddle around with anyone's bathroom fittings in their own homes and so on. I, I'm going to find myself speaking for the water industry, but I know that is part of their thinking. So I'm I'm pretty sure that the regional water planning and the individual. Um, strategies of the water companies will very much look to address that so in their current water management plans they already put in steps where they were reducing down their level of leakage i have no doubt they'll be looking again at those issues and it may very well form a, a, a significant element of their going forward so we really have to watch this space the leakage reduction used to be conditional on some economic test an economic level of leakage that's largely been rejected as a concept now all leakage is bad leakage must be minimized so far as technically feasible so there's definitely a big drive on leakage but um by just addressing leakage does not compensate for the number of new homes planned in cambridge at different scales all right well thank you everybody and that was a really enjoyable session. I mean, I've learned a lot myself in that session from, from Marina and Elliot and, and Anna. So thank you for coming and attending. Thank you to the team for being here as well. As you can see, if, you can, if you've can, if you got comments and we really, really encourage you to get involved and participate and think about you know, what you can contribute to the, the consultation. You can find the consultation on the, on the, on the website, which is shown up there. And um, there's a lot of chat going on the social media as well. So if you hashtag GC local plan, or gain the QR code, you'll take us straight to the website and then um, you can either get involved in a short survey or you can get more detailed comments in there. And as I say, we were running until sort of early early, early December, so please stay tuned for further sessions um, that we'll be running. I wish you all have a lovely evening. Thanks for those of you who did attend um, and I'll see you hopefully soon. And thank you again. I really thank my panel. It's been great. So thank you and have a lovely evening. <laughs>